I will be reading John 19, 28 through 30. Later knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Siéntense, por favor. Siéntense. Well, good morning, church. Andrew was completely right. We had a great day of golf yesterday. Um, I had a great team to work with. It was fun. Uh, I was the D player. If you know golf, you know what that means. <laughs> a, B, C. Ah, never mind. But anyway, I love the game. I just don't play that well. But so anyway, I was thinking, and I was telling this to Brother Thweet. Jim was on the team. Jim and Sam and Dick. So I thought, you know, you've got a shepherd on my team, on our team, and you've got the guy behind the pulpit. So I think we ought to get a little bit of a lenience, you know, a little bit of help. So I went to Andrew and I asked him, I said, listen, I know that you've given each player two mulligans. For those of you who don't play golf, mulligan is grace. It is a great description of God's grace, which means you don't earn it, you don't deserve it, you just get it. It is a do-over. And thank God for the do-overs that he gives us, but I thought I need more than two do-overs. I said, Andrew, <laughs> at the very least give the shepherd and the guy in the pulpit Three mulligans, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I was telling Jim that, and he said he should have pushed for the twelve apostles. And that's true. He should have pushed for the twelve. I, we each got two, so that was it, you know. By the second hole, mine were gone. Buenos dias, mis hermanos y hermanas. Somos la familia de Dios. Is bueno que estamos aquí juntos. It is always good to be together, church. Last Sunday, we talked about Lazarus. John chapter 11. It's a great story. What a remarkable story. And so I thought this morning, since this is what Christendom refers to as Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week. Next week we'll be celebrating Easter. The Christian world will be, the Christian church all over the world. And so I thought since we're in the Gospel of John, we'll just work it out to where we cover John the last couple of Sundays, and then we'll move into uh, his triumphal entry into Jerusalem all the way to the cross, and then next week we'll pick up with John chapter 20, the great uh, chapter on the resurrection of Jesus. Now, last Sunday we talked about Lazarus, so just for a moment, let's go back and let's, let's see the stone still rolled over Lazarus' tomb. Jesus has already had the prayer. He's already uh, asked the Father, said, thank you, Father, for, for hearing me. I know you always hear me, but I say this on behalf of those listening that they may believe that I am the one that you sent. And so he concludes his prayer, and then with a loud voice, John says, Jesus exclaimed, Lazarus, come out. Stone, of course, was rolled away. I said the stone, the stone was rolled away. Lazarus, come out, and up and out walks Lazarus. Still in his funeral shroud, the linen. So Jesus said, unbind him and let him go. Then John closes this incredible moment with these words. John 11, 45 and 46. He says, Therefore, some of the Jews who accompanied Mary believed in him. But others went directly to the Pharisees to tell them what Jesus had done. That is really hard for me to fathom. I can't understand how anyone could witness that moment and then instead of just falling down and, and, and calling Christ blessed and, you know, the Son of God, they run off to the Pharisees. What it does do, however, because in John chapter 12, Jesus enters Jerusalem, what it does remind us of, there were two groups 
people in Jerusalem during this Feast of Unleavened Bread, the last few days of our Lord's life on the face of this earth. One group were those who believed. They're the ones who had, who had strewn the way with palm branches, which was a prophetic, um, historical, cultural thing to do for a conquering king arriving. And so they, would, they, they put down the palm branches. Um, and Jesus rode in, right, on the foal of a donkey, fulfilling the, the prophetic word from Zechariah 9 and verse 9. And so Jesus, as he enters Jerusalem, they shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, which in Hebrew means save or rescue. And they gave him all the glory. That was one group. But I can tell you, church, within five days... The other group was shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Our story this morning, I'd like to pick it up with what is truly the passion of Christ. Now, once again, referring to Christians all over the world, generally in church history, Passion Week began on Sunday with the triumphal entry. But in fact, if you piece together the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll realize that there was only about a 22-hour period of real passion. It began on a Thursday evening with the establishment of the, of the Lord's Supper. The, they were celebrating the great Passover meal, the Seder, early. And then it concluded with Jesus on the cross. And so let's very quickly look at the upper room moment. And you can see this in Matthew 26 and Mark 14 and Luke 22 and John 13 and 19. Those are the passages. As we put together the fourfold gospel, this is what it reminds us, this is what it tells us of. So you have the upper room moment, and then from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane, from the Garden of Gethsemane you've got the, the trial, and then of course you have the crucifixion. We're going to conclude with the seven last words of Jesus on the cross as we read through this gospel narrative. Okay, so on Thursday night, we find Jesus in the upper room of a nameless friend. And you've heard me share this text quite often, but it so fits in well here. On Thursday night, Jesus is in the upper room and he's getting ready to break bread to, to celebrate the Passover meal. And he institutes what we've already received this morning, and that is the Lord's Supper. In the course of this meal, Jesus takes the bread out of its Jewish context. Remember now that the, the purpose for the Passover celebration was to commemorate deliverance from physical bondage out of Egypt. So you've got God's people every year remembering that God delivered them from, from slavery right out of Egypt. Well, when we come to the Lord's Supper, it is very much the same, only with a much greater moment. And that is, it commemorates our deliverance from sin. And so you have this being instituted in the course of a meal. Jesus takes the bread out of context and blesses it and breaks it and says, take and eat for this is my body. Then he took the cup, the third cup, the cup of redemption, the cup of blessing. It was also called because it always preceded the blessing, the closing blessing. So he took the third cup and then he said he blessed it and he said, drink of it all of you for this is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. And then the four Gospels reveal that they sang a hymn and then they repaired to the Mount of Olives. They, they went to the Mount of Olives, very close to where they were, probably in John Mark's home in the family house there in Jerusalem. And from all that I've read, it was John Mark's family who owned the orchard that they retreated to. And there was a man-made garden there, perhaps by John Mark's father or whoever made the garden, and they called it Gethsemane, which meant olive press. It was an orchard of olive trees. And so now you have the upper room, and now they're moving 
Thursday night still, but late Thursday night. Now they're moving to the garden. Jesus has now 11 apostles, not 12. Judas has already gone into the city to betray him. So the 11 apostles follow Jesus to the garden. He leaves eight of the 11 at the outer gate and takes with him the closest friends he has, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and the great apostle Peter. So you have Peter and James and John and Jesus uh, they, they go into the inner garden, and there the Bible says, Luke tells us that, that Jesus went a stone's throw away from where they were. Had to be real close, but he wanted to separate himself, and he prayed. He was in agony. And the prayer you've heard so many times, it is a wonderful prayer that we too could use, at least the closing part of it. He said, Abba, Father, remove this cup from me, this cup of anguish. This cup of death, but not my will be done, your will be done. He goes back and he finds Peter and James and John sleeping. Now we're in the early Friday morning hours. So at, you know, 1, 2, 3 a.m., early morning. They've been up all the previous day. They're all exhausted. And Jesus comes back. He finds them asleep. He wakes them up. And he says, could you not watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you do not enter into temptation. For though the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. And then he goes off again. And we're told in Scripture that he prayed the second prayer, very similar, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, your will be done. He goes back, they're asleep again. He goes off a third time and he says, Father, remove this cup, you know, your will be done. He comes back and this time he wakes them up again and he says, rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Judas leads a mob, a mob of not just those Jews in the city, but he leads the Sadducean guards who are going to arrest him. The chief priests are there. They're all wanting to, 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 to find Jesus and to arrest him, right? They were also, by the way, looking for Lazarus to kill him again, you know, to have him die a second time. But they were looking for this moment, at this moment for Jesus. And that's when Judas walks up and kisses Jesus and says, Hail, Master. And Jesus says, Do what you must do. Do it quickly, you know. And then Jesus turns to the guards and asks, Whom do you seek? This is in John 19. Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. And knowing, you know, we're speaking Aramaic here, and the guards, clearly, that was their first language. They also spoke Aramaic, the dialect of Hebrew. And that's what Jesus was speaking. And they understood that what he just said was, was the, the title that only Yahweh had. And so the moment they heard, I am he, they withdrew in fear. And they arrested Jesus, and we don't have time to go through the entire trial, but know that first of all, it was the chief priests who tried Jesus. And they beat him and mocked him, and Luke says, spit on him, right? This is, this is just the Jews now, not the Romans yet, just, just the chief priests. So he, our Lord's already gone through at least one beating, but they didn't have the power to execute the Jews were not given the power to put anyone to death. And so they dragged him before Pilate. Now we're talking about early Friday morning. They dragged him before Pilate and they insisted that he try Jesus and that he execute Jesus. And so Pilate went through the interrogation and he said, I find nothing wrong. And what did the Jews say? Well, the Jews said, well, he, he, you, you've got to do it again. And then finally, Pilate understood that to appease the authorities, something else had to happen. So he explained, we, not we, he said, you, you have a custom that I will release the Roman authorities, that I'll release one prisoner every 
feast of the unleavened bread. Once a year, I'll release you one prisoner. So what does he do? He goes in the dungeons and he finds the most notorious prisoner he can find, Barabbas. Think about the name, by the way. We don't have to know a whole lot of Hebrew to understand what the name means. B-A-R, bar in Hebrew, is son of Abba. We're talking about his very name was son of the father. How ironic. And so Pilate stood before the chief priests and the crowds and said, um, Whom shall I release to you? And they said, Barabbas, Barabbas. And he said, What shall I do with Jesus? And they said, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate washes his hands. He then has our Lord scourged. That is the most cruel, horrific whipping that one could receive. Did a little more research this previous week and looked up Scourge again, and, and they have uncovered, archaeologists, various types of Scourge utensils, whips. They're, it's a very short whip. It's not like the bull whip that we have in our Western days. It's a short little whip. Normally it had nine leather strands. And at the end of each strand, they could tie anything they chose. They could put a knot in it. They could tie pieces of metal or iron, anything that would flail the flesh. And the, and the perpetrator, the one who was delivering the, the lashing, would have to stand very close. And it must have been a very bloody scene. And so before Jesus, our Lord, even carried the cross, he was scourged. And then the Roman soldiers made a crown out of thorns and drove it into his head, put a purple robe about him just, just to mock the fact that he said he was royal, royalty, the king of the Jews. And then he had to make his own way to Golgotha. It's a Hebrew Aramaic word meaning the place of the skull. It must have looked like a skull. And we think, at least when, in, in my mind's eye, with the movies you see, you see, you know, the hill high. And by the word, Calvary is a Anglo, uh, an anglicized, um, you know, it's, it's a Latin word. It, same, same word means skull, but, it, but it, in Latin. So we sometimes say hill of Calvary, but in fact, in the scriptures, the only word we have is Golgotha, that Aramaic word. But it was a low, it, it, it was, you know, it was designed that way, just lifted up so the passers-by could see the ones being executed. It was located about 600 meters, about a half a mile or so, from where the uh, praetorium was. So all of the prisoners had to drag these heavy crosses about a half a mile. But Jesus couldn't make it. He was too weak. He had been beaten, scourged, um, you know, the crown of thorns. He, he was completely exhausted. And so he fell under the load. And some, you know, the moment a Roman guard will take the tip of that spear and, and tap anybody on the shoulder, they were a temporary slave. And so the Roman guard realized that, that, that this Jesus of Nazareth can't possibly, you know, finish the journey to, 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 to Golgotha. So he just tapped somebody. It happened to be Simon, probably a, on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem during that holy festival of the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover. And so Simon of Cyrene grabbed the cross and had to chug it. The moment, you know, the moment he was tagged, he was a slave. He realized that. And they go all the way to Golgotha and there with between two thieves, two other prisoners, they laid all three crosses down. They took the prisoner, the two, and then plus the Son of God and laid him on the cross. They had large metal spikes <clears throat> And they simply, we don't know if they drove it through the hand or through the wrist because the text that we have, usually when the Romans, I've read, when they would do that, they would drive it through the lower hand to support the weight of the body. And so you've got metal spikes. They laid him out on the cross, hands. And then they would bend the knees and cross them and put the feet and the Roman soldiers who were accustomed to doing this. This was their job. I can't imagine a job like that, but they were the executioners, and there was always one officer with them, and that was the centurion. So the metal spikes in the 
hands and then in the feet. The hole was already dug, and so it took, I'm sure it took more than one soldier to lift the cross. So they lifted the cross and just dropped it right in. Don't you know it must have incredible pain? And that leads us to the few words that our Lord spoke that day. He began this six-hour ordeal at nine o'clock in the morning. Hebrew time, it was the third hour. The Hebrew day began at 6 a.m. That was hour number one. So the ninth hour would have been three o'clock in the afternoon. So this, this moment was six hours on Friday. In fact, Lucado has a book out years ago that, it, you know, six hours, one Friday. It's a good read. And so you have the cross and you have the darkness that covered the land. Well, I thought very quickly, and I'll have to do this uh, just in a few moments. I believe we can. The first word from the cross doesn't surprise me at all. And I suspect it won't surprise you either. Father, Abba, forgive them for they know not what they do. Well, forgive whom? Well, to begin with, today, forgive wit. That's clear. But no doubt he was also making reference to the centurion and the soldiers and the Jewish authorities and the Roman authorities and the 11. I mean, we've got 12 apostles. Who's at the foot of the cross? We have only John, the son of Zebedee. The other, you know, Judas betrayed him and the other 10 just scattered, scattered. They were gone. Peter denied him three times. And only John was there, and then the Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary, the wife of Clopas, who was the wife of Zebedee, and, and uh, Mary of Magdala. So you've got three ladies, his mother was there, and his beloved apostle, beloved disciple, John, the son of Zebedee. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The word forgive, and, and I know that we know this, but just as a reminder, the word forgive means to send away a VAC, send it away as far as the east is from the west. Don't just well be tolerant of them, Abba. You know, they completely send away their wrong. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. The second word was very similar. It was a word of forgiveness. You have two prisoners on both sides of Jesus. And one of the two prisoners railed at Jesus and said, if you are the Christ, then save yourself and save us. The other prisoner, the one that we often refer to as the thief on the cross, well, he, 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 was, he, he couldn't believe it. He said, do you not fear God? We deserve our punishment, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then he turns to Jesus and says, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And our Lord uttered these words, this day, today. You will be with me in paradise. Now, keep in mind, we're not talking about a conversation with three chairs having a cup of coffee. We're talking about three men hanging on the cross with metal spikes in no doubt in, in excruciating pain. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, in church, I have used in times past a illustration, pardon me, a true Story, of course, April the 19th, 2015. And I'll do it very quickly, I promise, because I've used it two or three times, I know. You've got ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. You've got the terrorists who have, at that time, had just taken over northern Libya. And so you have 20 Egyptian Christians, Coptic Christians. You remember the scene? They were all in orange jumpsuits. There was a 21st person there. He was actually the leader. The, he was the, the boss, the working boss of these 21, uh, of these 20. He was from Ghana. And the terrorists would stand behind each Christian and say, Do you reject Jesus and to the person, they said, no, and who is your God? And so they began to, to sever the heads, decapitate, execute these, 
these martyrs. And then they came to the last, knowing that he was the leader, but also knowing that he was not from Egypt. So they asked, who is your God? That's when he said, my God is their God. This is just kind of the gospel according to Whittington, so forgive me. I have no idea other than what I read in the text. But when I first heard that in 2015, this is what I thought of. Yes. Not only two words of forgiveness... But he cared for his mother. So the third word from the cross was looking at his mother. Behold thy son. And looking at John, the only apostle there. And yet one, the Bible replete, the, 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 where scripture just is replete of the gospel saying that the one whom Jesus loved, he said, behold thy mother. And then John adds in John 19, John adds from that Hour forward, the disciple took her into his own home and cared for her. I find that so warming. Not only is my Lord, our Lord, the Son of God, but also he was the Son of Man. And Mary was his mother. I don't know where his brothers were. I've wondered about that. Matthew 13, we know that James and Joseph and Simon and Judas were his brothers. Apparently the sons of Mary. But they weren't anywhere to be found. They weren't believers at this time, but by God's grace and mercy, all four of them became pillars in the church. And they believed the moment he was raised from the dead, all of his brothers, one writes, that's the book, the, 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 uh, the letter of James, written by his own brother James. Where James was at the foot of the, he wasn't anywhere to be found. So we've got Jesus caring about his mother, saying, you know, woman, which was a very uh, uh, honorary term, a, a woman, behold thy son. Behold, looking at John, behold thy mother. And from that hour forward, the disciple took Mary into his own home. Now, very quickly, as a very quick aside, I've read also, and I probably shouldn't go into this to take too much time, but I've also read that um, Mary, the wife of Clopas, who was uh, Clopas Zebedee, who was uh, his surname Zebedee, given name, you know, Clopas, that Mary was Mary's sister. Don't know if that's the case or not, but church history really comes across and says that, yes, Mary, they were sisters. If that's the case, then Jesus was turning to his cousin, John, and saying, John, take care of my mother. Which also makes sense when the uh, mother of James and John, um, on the way to Jerusalem, kind of... Um, cornered Jesus and said, when you come into your kingdom, put my sons on both sides of your throne. That would have made a whole lot of sense if indeed she was talking to her nephew. But that's just for food for thought. Understand that Jesus cared about his mother, and obviously this is the third word. The fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh word, um, every, you know, as you read the text, they seem to be uh, bound together. It's, this is the only expression we have in all four of our Gospels that's wh wh where the Aramaic is preserved. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I don't have to remind us that God and sin are as incompatible as day and night, as light and darkness, as love and hate. The moment I sin... It's not a matter of salvation by God's grace. The only reason we're saved by grace in the midst of our sin is because he's already paid the price. The sin is forgiven. If no price is being paid, then God, the Father, Son, and Spirit, there's, there, I have no avenue to God because I have feet of clay and I sin. And I believe at this moment, Jesus truly not only felt abandoned, not only felt separated, but actually was. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? After this moment, 
our Lord said, I thirst. Now, tradition has it, and as you piece together the Gospels, this is how I read it, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it requires the fourfold Gospel to really kind of piece this together by God's plan, by His own plan. That there were two moments when the prisoners on the cross could drink. One, at the very beginning, generally they were given vinegar laced with gall or myrrh and anesthesia. That would help deaden the pain. Jesus refused it. He didn't take it. I think he wanted all of his wits. But toward the end of the sixth hour, he prompted the soldiers to give him something. Perhaps to fulfill the prophecy... Psalm, uh, Psalm 69, 1, they gave me vinegar to drink. And if, again, you read the context, we're talking about the suffering servant here. They gave me vinegar to drink. So he said, I thirst. And there was a long hyssop reed. Gabe read it, read it well this morning. Thank you, brother, for reading the text. And the hyssop reed was, there was vinegar and water. And that was natural, by the way, the vinegar and the water. And so they would take this sponge-like plant and lift it up. So the soldiers, they heard, I thirst. And so they, somebody, maybe the centurion told them, you know, here it is. And they put it up to his mouth. Apparently he drank a little bit, a little bit. But following this, he goes into the last two words on the cross. It is finished. And Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So John records, by the way, of the seven words, three come from John, three from Luke, and one from Matthew and Mark. Put it all together. John records, after he had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. Well, I ask you, what, what, what is finished? Well, the whole scheme of redemption, the whole plan of salvation... Everything reached its culmination right here. And then, of course, the glorious resurrection truly culminated the whole plan that God had been planning from the beginning of creation, by the way. Knowing that we would fall, knowing that we would sin, it is finished. It's a very unique word. The word literally means complete, but it was only used in banking terms. It was as if the last installment was paid. Do you remember the story that I shared two or three months ago about my first car, that 61 Chevy that I paid $600 for, but I didn't have a dime? I had to go to the bank. I said, Dad, I really, I was 16. I said, Dad, I really want this. He says, okay, do you have the money? I don't have the money. He said, well, you've got a problem. So he said, let's go to the bank. He said, I'll co-sign for you. So we go to the bank and my father co-signs the note. $600. The banker reminded me now, you know, Mr. Whittington, I will need 40, whatever it was, $42 a month for this payment. I said, no problem. I work for Handy Andy. I'm a stock boy and I'm a good one and, and I'll be there forever. I'm good. <laughs> and I remember the banker said, well, don't lose the job. <laughs> About three weeks later, my boss at Handy Andy, I was a grocer, he was a grocer and he comes to me and says, I'm sorry, Mike, we have to let you go. I said, what? I, you can't. <laughs> you can't. And he said, well, I don't have a choice, so you're gone. I remember going home and talking to Dad. And just, I don't know what to do. He said, well, I guess we've got to see the banker because they'll want the car back. I said, okay. We go in, you've heard the story, I can't believe I'm doing it again. We go in, and there's the banker, and he said, yeah, you know, I've got to take the car back. And then Dad paid for it. Boom. He didn't have much money. Whatever it was, 500-something dollars. Whoa. So I left the bank, and I drove for the next two years until I gave it to my brother. I drove a car that I didn't deserve. I, it was a gift. I didn't pay for it. On the check, you know, this is when we kept all our checks. Dad wrote, paid in full. That's what happened. It's the only reason we're here. I mean, we wouldn't be here otherwise. 
We might be acquaintance somewhere in this city, but we wouldn't be together in the Lord's house. He finished it. And then Luke says, he cried with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he took his last breath. Years ago, I, I was at a Good Friday service where I heard these seven words talked about, and, 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 and I don't know how many of those I've heard in times past, but the, but the person who was doing this presentation brought up something that I use all the time. He said, it's not just making reference to Jesus on the cross and his life. It's your whole life. It, it's, it's your prayer. After you, I don't know how else to interpret God's providence than for me to do everything that I know to do and then let go. I don't know any other way to do it. And so you do all that you can do. And then in the end, it's like thy will be done. In the end, I say, into your hands I commit my sons. Into your hands I commit my family. Into your hands I commit the church. Into your hands I commit whatever it is I'm praying for. Because in the end, I have no control. And Jesus said, Abba, into your hands. What better hands for me to take my last breath? I can tell you when he talked about, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There are a few things I pray for when it comes to one day when I shall take my last breath. And we all will, by the way. I don't know if I'll die tragically in some accident. I don't know if it'll be some sort of insidious disease. I don't know if it'll be malicious intent. I don't know if it'll be old age. And I don't even think about it. But I do pray that I not die alone. That I do pray. Now, that may not happen. I may die alone, meaning no sons or wife or family or friends. That's how I think Jesus felt, by the way, the fourth word on the cross. But into your hands I commit my spirit. Now, the moment he took his last breath, not only had darkness covered the land, but the Bible clearly tells us, Matthew especially, that there was a huge earthquake and the ground shook and, and the temple, the curtain in the temple was torn in two. God will never, there will never more be a partition between God and his people. Just ripped in two. And Matthew even says the dead in Christ, some of them came up from the graves and walked around. Now, the, the, the Roman centurions privy to all of this. Every word Jesus spoke, the darkness, the earthquake, the temple, the, the, the graves, saints walking about. And there were a lot of burial grounds on that side of the city. And all he could do is exclaim, truly, this was the Son of God. That was Friday, and Jesus died. But we both know Sunday's coming. We know that. Today is Friday in this text, but Sunday is coming. And it's a beautiful way for us to close this moment and thank God for what we're going to be celebrating even next week. If I could invite our shepherds, my dear brothers up here, those who lead this flock, we'll have a moment of prayer. And as our elders walk forward to receive God's people, what better time than this to, to understand what our Lord has done for us? having died and gloriously been resurrected three days later. And so we too believe. And there is an order to this. One cannot repent until they truly believe. And who in the world would confess until they say, I repent? And why in the world get wet until you've gone through some of these thoughts? Of course, it's a natural order. Believe and repent. And confess. And then when you've died to your sins, be buried in baptism. And then what happens? And then you arise to do what? You're no longer a corpse. The dead man, the dead woman is gone. You arise to walk a new life. And that's what this is all about. 
So Jesus encourages us to respond, always respond at this moment as we stand and sing. Thank you.